So, you, oh, I can't wait to show you this, what Abby's bought for my door. So, do you want to explain? Well, I got a nice festive door bow for my door, and I thought mum would love that, so I got hers in silver. We've just put it up now. It's beautiful. Look at this. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, what a lovely start to a Monday morning. And you could get better than this to the start of Christmas shopping. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to day 11 of Vlogmas. So we've been out, um, had a Abby treated me to a white mocha. Oh, it was I've never had one before and it was gorgeous. Um, and then we got on with the shopping. Abby thought it was going to be busy, but it was quiet. Um, the only queuing was um, in Primark um, and a little bit. Um, I think another shop was Poundland. Um, but other than that, it was it was OK. If you, you're in need of getting more prezzies or haven't started yet, definitely, if you've got a Primark near you, go in it they're reducing things already and if you're on a budget it's brilliant um happy sport me this love honestly I, I will show you it later but it's me um and that had been reduced as well down a good price um but i can't i can't wait to show it and i cannot what i know i won't give you any more so um, I bought just a couple of bits for me and I bought a nice pair of new fluffy slippers which I needed and um, I've bought a book um, which I'll show you later. So let's get on to the advents. So let's do the Cadbury first. So day 11. Oh, curly whirly. Okay. So the jigsaw, there it is. And this one again was a bit tricky um, because you're working in with that, that and that. I got there. So, number 11. Okay. And, oh, look at this. He reminds me of the Coca Cola Santa. Isn't that adorable? There we go. So, Bird Oh, sorry, Walls. Bird Street. Oh. Oh, that looks like a shimmery, doesn't it? Oh, that's pretty. Very pretty. Let's put it with. There we go, that's 10. There we go. Very nice. <laughs> Candy, do you like it? Yeah? <laughs> okay, Fig, your turn. So let's see what we got today. Let's do the knot. Okay. 
Teddy's presents for his family. Please put these, these in his basket. What's he got? Ooh. Oh, look. Oh, so cute. I love the fabric. That fabric is beautiful. Oh. Oh, Fig, what lovely wrapping you've done. Okay, so we've got to put that in your shopping bag. Let's do it. He's very good at his wrapping. Look at that. Oh, Fig. You're getting a bit weighed down now. All these things in your bag. I think you need some a rest. Yeah, let's put you in your basket. There we go. Look at him. And the last one tomorrow, guys. Okay, so, number 11. Let's move this a little bit so it doesn't fall off. one bobtail? I can't remember their names. So if anyone knows, let me know. Okay, so oh, I think we'll put them there and uh, they can discuss what they think is in those lovely present boxes. So I am going to make a cup of tea. Um, not sure what I want to craft. And um, yeah, before I read you the story, I'll show you what Abby got me. Honestly, it, it's adorable, Honestly, really adorable. And um, some of you might be rushing to Primark to get one yourselves. So right, see you later. So, bye for now. Bye. So before I start showing you um, my little bits that I bought today and what Abby got me, I just want to show you this. Um, I embroidered this, oh, a couple of years ago. But isn't it a gorgeous design? Um, I made it into a cushion and I used this lovely robin fabric that i had um it was a set of fat quarters that i got from hobbycraft and they say this was quite a few years ago uh, i love it so i got this book it was three for six but i only wanted this book so it was 250 the works they got loads of different ones there um, but by the blurb at the back, it looks really good. And it's a 1940s mystery, which is down my alley. Um, I've got these slippers. They were Primark. Look at this. You, I mean, quite a few of you would have seen them. This one's called the Snuddy. Primark. Um, they were £18 and they reduced to 12 But look. I love it. So you've got your long sleeves and you've got your hoodie. I just love the ducks. 
they had loads of different designs there um strawberry prints hedgehogs loads um and obviously it's been reduced i mean you say abby got me this but i love it um but what a lovely you know gift um to get and it's so good that they reduced the prices before you know christmas ends isn't that adorable i can't wait to put it on and the other thing that come today or came today i ordered this yarn off ebay it's a four ply and i wanted a pale gray um and i'm gonna use this you know i wanted i said to you i wanted to do the um christmas lights jumper but they've got a sock design and i want to do that first and as you know i've got those minis with the bright colors so i'm fine there um and so this is the color i wanted as the main so yeah and i'm putting it and pauline you gave me this bag didn't you look isn't it beautiful pauline soby bags isn't that adorable so i'm going to sort out the minis i've just got to purchase the pattern um and sort out my needles but yeah so hello and welcome back um we've got wally on my lap see him there um <laughs> I'm really hurting now. Um, I had a painkiller when I got back, but um, as the rest of the afternoon's gone on, I'm hurting a lot more, which I expected because we had um, the garden centre as well at the weekend. But I've got all the presents now. Um, there's just those what I got today to be wrapped. Um, I won't be doing it today. I'll see how I am to tomorrow, <clears throat> later in the day. Um, Winnie's coming tomorrow. Um, I was asked if I'd look after her um, because Simon had to go in because normally he works some of the time from home. Um, <clears throat> so he was going in tomorrow. And then uh, uh, this afternoon, um, it's FaceTime in Abby, and I said, oh, I'll see you in the morning then with Winnie. And she said, oh, you don't need to have him now. He doesn't have to go in. I said, oh, I was looking forward to looking after him. She goes, you can still look after if you want to. So, yeah, she's still coming around tomorrow. So, um, if I get a chance, I'll show you Winnie. And she's grown a little bit. She's getting a bit longer now. Um... But yeah, that'll be that'll be nice. And also, um, Mila's coming for a sleepover at the weekend. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> she'll be coming mm -hmm. Saturday after a football. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm really looking forward to that. She loves coming here for sleepovers. She really does. So um, we'll do a bit of vlogging because she loves joining me with the vlogging. Um, so yeah, that'll be nice. So... This afternoon, I did go on, back on with the appliquing. But I wished I'd sew machine that round because you've got the linen, yeah, is thin anyway. But when you're working, going through two lots of felt, it was really hurting my fingers. I've done it, but I've decided this bit here... Um, yeah, because that's going to go through the felt. <laughs> what are we doing? He wants cuddles. Um, going through the felt again. Um, and along here, I think I'm going to machine it. Because it's just really hurting my fingers. So I'll see how it goes on the machine. Yeah, it's only on the, say where there's like double thickness and it, it's hard to get the needle through. So, um, yeah, we'll see how that goes. So, oops. 
I've put the snow now. Let me put something behind it for you. <laughs> I've put the snow on the trees, the tree, and I've done more blanket stitch up here. So I've just got to do the rest around there. So, yeah, it's lovely to do, but just my fingers hurt. It's such a shame, but it will get done eventually. Um, I haven't oh, managed to do anything for Gracie. Um, I think I might do some of her this evening. Uh, what I have done it's because I've been out and what he's missed me. That's why he's well, it's kind of me. Yeah, I missed you too. Well, he wouldn't let you go in the shots, Spouse. No. So, like, <laughs> hello, give us kisses then, give me kisses, some kisses, kisses, mm -hmm. I'll give you kisses then, oh thank you, right, come on then, there's a good boy. So, where there's these little what I call red berries, <laughs> That's it. You go and lay around there. Good boy. Let me move the hot water bottle. There. All right. Find the dogs. Um. Yeah. Where the little red, what I call red berries are. I've com completed all those now. So there we are. It's completed. So, just the band to do now. Beautiful. I recommend this to Donnie if you haven't done it. It's beautiful. Lovely stitch, really is. Look how pretty that is. The only thing I've got to do is the date. But I don't want to put that in because I'm not sure I'm going to get that band done before the year is out. It might go into next year. So, I, I want to put the right... It's now on the rocking chair, put in... My throw down. <laughs> um, yeah, so I could put the 20 in. But yeah, I want to get onto the band now, which is. Let's see. Down there. I have um, measured what I need. And. Uh, cut it and I machined it last night on the edges so it's all ready for stitching obviously I'll have it around that way so that's ready not sure what the colour was for the um, band what's that oh, it's a, like a mixture of them all but I mean, it didn't use hardly any thread, to be quite honest. I mean, if you look, they're nearly full skeins. But, and the pine needles. Pine needles is quite used a lot, especially with the Jack Farm um, tree. Jack Foss tree farm. Um... But it's, so it'd be handy um, having them there for an, any other use for another stitch. But I'm well impressed that it hasn't used much, a lot at all. So, so I'm happy about that. That's going to look so lovely on a box. It really is so excited. So... Yeah, I'm quite impressed that I've continued on with that. And the band will be a nice little stitch. Oh, I don't want to leave the needle in. Where is it? I've got two. I'll just pop them out. 
There we go. So I'll probably start the band tomorrow. Okay, I'll put that down there. As you know, I've got a black trolley. Didn't fucking no, I can't bring it in. It's a three-tier one. Um, I got that from eBay oh, a few months ago. And then when my ex came round a few weeks ago, um, he brought a box. And inside the box was a cream three-tier trolley. And he said I thought that would be ideal for the craft room. So I haven't took it out yet because obviously wrapping and up there. Um, but once all that's done, um, I'm going to get that out and it's going to be ideal um, to use up there. Really handy. But I was <laughs> contemplating because this trolley is chock. I'm thinking, should I just bring that one down as well? And I have two in here, but I've only got a small living room, as you've seen. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to the extreme if I bring that one down as well. So yeah, I'll just have that one up upstairs in the craft room. Okay, so let's just have a little drink of my cup of tea. Abby was coming out in her cold today. And by the end of the day, <clears throat> when we FaceTimed, she sounded even worse. So, oh, honestly, this time of year, isn't it? Right then, now I need to remember what happened. Oh, yeah. So, Christmas at Fairacre by Miss Reed. And no holly for Miss Quinn. And she's now arrived at her brother's level, who's a vicar, and he's got three children. His wife, Eileen, is in hospital. And um, yeah, she's sort of walked into a bit of chaos and she's not happy with the mess at the house. So let's continue. And she was sit she sat in the chair, she's gone to sleep. And we're on chapter six. Oh, have a glasses while I remember. That's better. Okay. Miss Queen woke with a start and sat bolt upright in the bed. Close at hand, a church clock was striking midnight and its pulsing rhythm filled the room. Bewilderment and panic ebbed away as she lay down again. Of course, she was safe in her brother Lovell's back vicarage. This spare room, she remembered now, was close to the church tower. It must be frosty night tonight to be able to hear so clearly. Morning light would show... Rim would show rimy grass, no doubt, rimy grass, no doubt, and ice-covered puddles. The little birds huddled patiently on smart, sparkling twigs, awaiting any bounty flung from the kitchen. The last stroke died away and the old house sank back into silence. Sleep enveloped Lovell and the three children, whom she had had to come to look after over Christmas, whilst their mother was in hospital. Poor Eileen, she thought. Was she asleep too, or lying awake as she was herself? She envisaged the shadowy ward, a night nurse sitting in the one small pool of light, alert for any sound from a restless patient. How much luckier she was to be here alone and free from pain. With a sudden shock, she realised that it was now Christmas Eve. There would be wild excitement from her two nieces in the next few hours. Robin would be too young to understand, though. No doubt he would be infected by the general fever of anticipation. 
Did the children hang up stockings here, she wondered, or pillowcases, as she and Lovell had done in just such a drafty vicarage years ago? One Christmas in particular, she recalled vividly in that old Cambridgeshire house. She must have been about the same age as young Jenny, asleep next door. Her milk teeth were beginning to wobble, and one in the front, she remembered, had been tipped back and forth so often by her questing tongue that her mother had begged her to pull it out and have done with it. But fear had held her back, and even Lovell's pleased to give it a good jerk were in vain. Lovell, two years older, was young Miriam's hero. He could climb to the top of the yew tree while she stuck trembling halfway. He could make a whistle with his penknife and a holly, holly, hollow reed. He had bloodied Billy Boston's nose when he swore about their father and he learned geometry at the new day school in Cambridge. Whatever Lovell did, Miriam tried to, to, tried to do. Whatever Lovell told her, she believed implicitly. Whatever Lovell said was right was so, and whatever Lovell found wrong was, of course, quite wrong. That particular Christmas, Miriam was, was much exercised in her mind. Ruby, her six-year-old friend at school, has stated categorically that there was no Father Christmas. Miriam was horrified at such an infamous statement. Of course there is. You get presents, don't you? Ruby, skipping busily at the time, was offhand. Your mum and dad put some in there, she puffed twirling the rope. I don't believe it, said Miriam stoutly, but a cold hand seemed to clutch at her stomach. Could it be true? Could her father and mother have told her lies? Could Lovell? Never, she told herself. Lovell's all, Lovell always told her the truth. If there were no father Christmases, Lovell would have said so. It was Ruby who told lies. You don't know what you're talking about, she told the skipper of Bustley. I just know there's a Father Christmas, so there. Better stay awake and find out, shouted Ruby to Miriam, who was walking away. And maybe I will, thought Miriam, stubbornly, just to prove she's wrong. In the few days left before Christmas, she often asked her mother about this problem. But as always, the vicarage was fast filling with up with elderly relatives who were coming to spend Chris Christmas with the family and Mrs Queen was busy with preparations. Nevertheless, both parents replied kindly to Miriam's tentative inquiries about the authenticity of Father Christmas, but were vague and preoccupied. On the whole, though, she felt slightly reassured. Among the Christmas guests was a recently widowed young aunt with her four-year-old son, Sidney. The child was delicate and made even more so by his mother's molly coddling. Naturally, she fusses over him, Miriam heard her mother say to one of the elderly second cousins. He's all she has now, and he's a dear little boy. Lovell and Miriam did not think so. They thought him spoilt, a crybaby and a tale-teller. The fact that the poor child lisped only made him more ridiculous in their eyes. With childish heartless, they tease the little boy without mercy whenever, when they, <clears throat> sorry, whenever they had him alone. It so happened that this particular Christmas Eve brought snow to bleak East Anglia and the three children were wrapped up warmly and sent to play with injunctions to make a snowman. Lovell and Miriam, strong and boisterous, threw themselves into the task joyfully. But Sydney, half afraid of the bigger children and disliking the cold, did little. Come on, Thid, shouted Lovell. Lend a hand. Thid, 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 mocked Miriam, following Lovell's lead as usual. The children shook his head unhappily, near to tears, irritated by his apathy. The two young savages began to chase him round and round the half-built snowman. Within two minutes, the little boy was sobbing and struggling to escape from his tormentors. They pursued him ruthlessly until at last he fell wailing into the snowman and the bigger children incensed at the damage rolled the child back and forth in the snow. There they are. 
Now look what you've done. All our work's fault. We'll pay you out for this. They began stuffing snow down the neck of the child's jersey, giggling now, but still enjoying the feeling of power over, over this weakling. Sydney's cries attracted his mother. The three children were driven into the kitchen and the young queens were accused by Sydney's hysterical mother of gross cruelty. Mrs Queen banished her two to their bedrooms for an hour. After apologies all round, and Miriam spent the time wobbling the front tooth and thinking about the existence, or otherwise, of Father Christmas. Called down to tea after their penance, Miriam spoke urgently to Lovell as they went into the dining room. Ruby Adair at school said there wasn't a Father Christmas. Is it true? An extraordinary look came over Lovell's face. It was though, as though Miriam had hit him. He stuttered when he replied, a thing he only did when very upset. You don't want to believe everything Ruby says, he managed to say. I've never told you that, I ha told you that have I? The tension which has screwed Miriam's inside into a painful knot lessened at once, and the feeling of relief carried her through the hours until bedtime. She even managed to speak kindly to the loathsome Sydney, who insisted on sitting close to his mother. Bedtime came, the three children prepared the traditional snack for Father Christmas, a mince pie from, what, from each one, and a glass of orange squash, which Sydney chose as the best drink available. Miriam watched Lovell closely as they placed the food in the hearth. His face was solemn, and he was being uncommonly gentle, genteel with young Sydney. He would not take such trouble, thought Miriam, with relief, if he did not truly expect Father Christmas to arrive. The children went to bed. Over each bed rail hung an empty pillowcase. Miriam looked at hers as she lay awake. If, as silly Ruby said, one's parents filled it, then she would be bound to hear them. Despite her intention to stay alert, she was asleep in ten minutes. The, the sound of the door opening woke her hours later. All right, she heard her mother whisper. Her father answered, Master, sleep. Cold with horror, she lay motionless. She saw the empty pillowcase twitch from the bed rail and felt the bump of a full one as it was lodged, lodged at the foot of the bed. So that was how it was done. The door closed noiselessly. She lay there, numbed with shock. A painful lump swelled in her throat and hot tears began to trickle. Ruby was right. To think all this time her parents had lied and Lovell too. It was cruel. All these years she had loved Father Christmas and now it was spoilt. She crept from her bed and squatting on the floor she felt the various shapes in the pillowcase. There was the doll she had asked for and this box must be the tea set or a jigsaw puzzle. She could smell the fragrance of the tangerine tucked in a corner and could hear the rattle of the nuts in the other. Tears continued to course down her cheeks. She would not unpack things until morning light. And would she enjoy them? She wondered, knowing that Lovell had betrayed her. Would things ever be the same again? Her feet were cold as stones and she clambered back into bed. And as she did so, her restless tongue finally broke the loose tooth from its precarious moorings. Still weeping, she felt the edge of the new tooth thrusting through. She pulled the clothes about her and fell into uneasy sleep. Leaden eyed and leaden heart next morning, she did her best to share in the general excitement. At the breakfast table, she thanked all her relatives for their gifts. She could hardly bear to look at Lovell, so happy and unconcerned. Sydney was flushed with joy and excitement. All gone, he said, showing her father Christmas's empty plate. Did you see him? He pressed against Miriam anxiously. Did you see him? He persisted. Conscious of the eyes of all upon her, her heart raging with bitterness. Miriam took a deep breath. She turned her blazing gaze upon the traitor Lovell. No, 
I didn't, she burst forth. I didn't see Father Christmas, Sydney, but I'll tell you what I did see. The child looked up at her, smiling and trusting. Lovell's gaze was steady. Across the breakfast table, brother and sister were locked in a look. Very slowly, Lovell shook his head briefly, and with a wealth of meaning, he glanced at Sydney and then looked back at Miriam. It was a conspiratorial look, and it filled Miriam's quivering body with warmth and comfort. Now, in a flash, she understood. Suddenly, she was grown up. And she felt the first of her adult teeth this very morning. A little child she had been, just had been until now had the right to believe in this magic. She felt suddenly protective towards the young boy beside her. She and Lovell and all the other people present knew and faced the responsibilities of knowing this precious secret. Now she too was one of the elect. What did you see? asked Sydney. I saw the door closing, said Miriam. That's all. Across the table, Lovell smiled at her with approval. Her heart leapt and Christmas Day became again and the joyful festival she had always known. How sharply it came back, thought Miss Quinn, that memory of 30 years ago. The shock of her enlightenment was much was some measure of the joy that she had formerly felt in the myth of Father Christmas. She was glad that Jenny and Robin were still ardent believers and she must try and make sure that Hazel, on the brink of knowledge, did not suffer as she had done as a child and did not tarnish the glitter for the younger ones. Somewhere in some distant copse, a fox gave an eerie cry. The scudding clouds partly parted briefly and a shaft of moonlight fell across the bed. The night was made for sleeping, said Miriam to herself, and tomorrow there was much to be done. There were children to be tended, Eileen to, vi Eileen to visit, provisions to organise, and all to be accomplished amidst the joyous frenzy of Christmas Eve. Resolutely, she applied herself to sleep. So I shall stop there. Chapter seven. Little Sydney. It's so cute. So there we go. So page 73. There we go. It's glad to hear, I'm glad to hear that you're all still enjoying it. Um, as I said, you can't be a misread book. All of her books are lovely, really, really lovely and innocent. They really, really are. So there we go. That's it for this evening. So I shall finish off my little cup of tea and I will do Gracie the Frog. So I will see you in the morning. Take care. Thank you for watching. Bye.